Hi, I'm Professor David Atley. In this video, I'll be running through the Interpreting the HR Diagram Lab for my Topics in Astronomy class at CUNY's LaGuardia Community College. I'll be mixing my introductory slides that go over some of the lab material with the lab itself, which I'll review using the Microsoft Word app for Mac OS. If you're using Word on a different operating system, your version of Word may look slightly different from mine, but as long as you're using an, an up-to-date version, which is available for all CUNY students, you should be fine. Let's get started. The first couple of questions on today's lab rely on interpreting a schematic HR diagram, which is divided into quadrants that you'll see in a minute are going to be labeled A through D. The HR diagram graphs luminosity on the y-axis against temperature on the x-axis, with high luminosities on top and high temperatures on the left. If you run through using Stefan's law, you can work out the relative sizes, that is radii, of stars at different places on the HR diagram. And what you can figure out is that stars tend to decrease in radius as you move them to the left. So if you keep the same luminosity at constant temperature, the radius of the star has to shrink. And the radius tends to increase if you move a star up. That is, if you keep the temperature constant and increase the luminosity. Let's look at how we can interpret the position of a star on the HR diagram using that information. In the lab, you'll see we have this diagram with four quadrants labeled A through D, as promised. And so what we want to do is, for each of those quadrants, figure out whether a star in that quadrant is hot or cool, large or small, and luminous or dim. So for letter A, I might say, okay, based on its position, I think the star in quadrant A might be cool, large, and dim. By the way, those are not the correct answers. Some of them might be right, some of them might be wrong, so you'll have to figure it out for yourself. But the general point here is that you want to mark the appropriate column in each of the three quantities, temperature, radius, and luminosity. Once you've done that, the next question is going to ask you in which of those four quadrants would you find an O-type main sequence star and then an M-type main sequence star. Remember that the Harvard Spectral Classification Scheme arranges stars according to their temperature. Mass governs all of the other observed properties of main sequence stars, including temperature, but mass is very hard to measure. So we use temperature as sort of a temp, as a mass proxy. And if we arrange the stars in order of temperature, they come in this weird sequence of non-alphabetical letters that goes O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. So the O-type stars are the hottest, and the M-type stars are the coolest. The originator of the sequence, the astronomer Annie Jump Cannon, figured out a mnemonic device to help remember the order of the letters if you're unfamiliar with them. And that mnemonic device is a really silly sounding sentence that says, oh, be a fine guy or girl, as you prefer, kiss me. So it's dumb, it's funny, and most importantly, it's memorable. Um, so that should help you remember the order of these letters. Remember, O-types, the first ones, are hottest, and M-types, the last ones, are coolest. If we look at the main sequence on the HR diagram, we see that it runs from the top left down to the lower right, with the hottest stars on the upper left and the coolest stars on the lower right. And you can figure out for yourself how some of the other variables, like lifetime or luminosity, that also correlate with mass, might show up on the diagram. So when you go to try to answer this question, you have to ask yourself, okay, 
where are the O-type stars going to show up on this main sequence? What quadrant is that? A, B, C, or D? What about the M-type stars? Where are they? The next question is going to ask you to label an HR diagram with the appropriate axes. So remember that the HR diagram is a graph, and it's a graph of luminosity on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. But there is this weird historical thing in which temperature, remember, is backwards. So the hot stars are on the left, and the cool stars are on the right. To do that labeling, I'm going to use a text box and then also the drawing tools available from Microsoft Word. For example, I might say that I want to insert a text box to label the y-axis. So I'm going to grab a vertical text box rather than a horizontal one. Just because I'm labeling the y-axis. And then I might write in that text box luminosity. Okay, that's running counter to the usual direction, but that's fine. We don't care about that. And then I might use the draw tools to draw in an arrow for each axis showing the direction that values are increasing. So I might decide, okay, I think, whoops, I think that the temperature increases from left to right, just like x values always do when I make a graph. So I'm going to draw in an arrow. Like that. The next question then asks you to insert labels for each of the major luminosity classes that are sketched into those axes that we were just looking at. The luminosity classes that we're concerned with in topics in astronomy are three. There are others that I'm skipping over for the purposes of this class. They are the supergiants, which get Roman numeral one, the giants, which get Roman numeral three, and the dwarfs, or the main sequence stars, which get Roman numeral 5. And we can see that each one of those different luminosity classes is going to show up in a different place on that HR diagram. We'll notice, okay, up here, near the top of the diagram, up here, near the top of the diagram, those are the supergiants. And then the giants and the main sequence, or dwarf stars, appear in other places. And based on that, I'll come over here to my axes and grab this box. That box that you saw actually outlines a text box that I've pre-inserted for you. And so all you have to do is to type in the appropriate Roman numeral. So if I think this horizontal line up here corresponds to the giants, which again is Roman numeral 3, I'll type in a Roman numeral 3, etc. You'll notice that I've skipped a couple of questions which are going to ask you to interpret the diagram and figure out the connection between luminosity, radius, and temperature from that labeled graph that you've just put together. So I'll leave that to you to try and figure out with the hint that I included some important information about that at the beginning of today's video. So the next question that I'll talk about is considering protostars. Protostars are an important stage in the evolution, particularly the birth process, for stars. Protostars are this intermediate stage between a wispy, low-density cloud of gas and an actual bona fide star. Protostars are clouds of gas that have collapsed enough that they have a photosphere, an apparent surface. But they're not yet hot and dense enough in their cores for fusion to begin. So instead, protostars power themselves through gravitational collapse. That is, as they're shrinking, they convert their potential energy, sometimes called energy of position in my lectures, into kinetic energy, energy of motion. The kinetic energy of a gas reflects its temperature. So, as the protostar shrinks under its own gravity, it heats up. And 
by heating itself up, allows itself to emit black body radiation. As these protostars shrink, they're going to move along tracks in the HR diagram called Hayashi tracks. Different protostars in different masses have different specific tracks, but we do see one thing in common, which is that generally speaking, protostars start in the top right corner of the HR diagram, and they move down, and they move left. That's telling us how their luminosity and temperature are changing with time due to their changing position on those vertical and horizontal axes. We can also infer a change in radius. If you need a hint, have a look at this diagram again and think about what it would mean for a star to move from the upper right to the lower left on this diagram. What's happening to the radius of a star moving in that direction? The next question requires you to understand a little bit about how astronomers measure brightness and color. We do this using what's called the magnitude system. Magnitudes are an ancient means of measuring the brightness of celestial objects. They date back to the ancient Greeks, so thousands of years ago. As a result of their antiquity, the magnitude system is just a little bit odd. Um, for example, they're backwards. The brightest objects have the lowest magnitudes. For example, the star Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, has a magnitude of negative one, whereas the faintest objects visible to the human eye have a magnitude of about six, maybe six and a half, depending on your eyes and your location, but somewhere in that ballpark. And then the faintest objects ever recorded, which have been measured by the Hubble Space Telescope, have a magnitude of approximately 30. Astronomers take these magnitudes and combine them to then calculate colors, or color indices to give them their more proper name. A color index is how astronomers decide whether a star is blue or red or in between, and we do that by comparing the brightness of stars in two distinct filters. This is similar to how your digital camera works. When you take a picture using a digital camera, your camera will actually record the same pixel in three different color filters, usually red, green, and blue. And then the software attached to the camera combines those three different measurements of brightness into a single color pixel. And then of course combines all the pixels to make an image. Astronomers do something similar, but somewhat different. We actually measure entire images in different filters, measure the magnitudes of individual stars, and then compare the magnitudes directly. So for example, if we had a blue filter and a green filter, which astronomers call visual or V, we might take the difference B minus V, and that will tell us the color of our star. Question number eight requires you to calculate these B minus V colors for 10 stars whose blue and visual, so green, magnitudes I've provided for you. For example, if I come down to the first line here and I say that 14.05 minus 12.98, that's going to give me the B minus V color index for this particular star, which in this case is 1.07. Okay, so you get that one for free. That's a good answer. You, you get to do the other nine. And then once you finish that, you'll copy those into an Excel spreadsheet that I've provided for you. So you would copy that value, 1.07, from the first row into the first row in the spreadsheet. And once you've entered that value, you'll see a blue diamond appear at the appropriate location on the graphic. Every time you enter a new data point, a new location will be marked on your graph. And once you've finished copying all of your data into the spreadsheet, you'll have a complete graph, which produces a color magnitude diagram. This is the observer's version of the HR diagram. So rather than looking at luminosity and temperature, we're looking at color and magnitude. 
So once you've filled that in, you'll copy the complete graph from the Excel spreadsheet back into your lab file. So I'll just come up here and say copy. And then paste. The final diagram is a little bit big, so I'm going to shrink it down just a bit to save some space. And then your final two questions will rely on having the completed diagram that you can refer back to. Question number 10 asks you to mark three major evolutionary stages on this completed diagram using the graphic at the left as a reference. So you'll notice that the graphic at the left is a little bit more filled in than the background stars that I put into the Excel spreadsheet. Um, and that's just because of how I selected the stars to go in, so some of them are missing in the background here compared to the one from the textbook. But you can see some of the same general features. Um, so the three major features that you're going to have to highlight are the main sequence, the red giant branch, and the horizontal branch. So I can look down here and say, oh, that main sequence kind of swirls up from the lower right, just like the main sequence over here. So there's my main sequence. And I'll insert a text box. and label that place main sequence. And then you'll do the same for the red giant branch and the horizontal branch. And then the last thing that the lab asks you to do is to choose one of those 10 stars that you graphed and to figure out their color, their evolutionary stage, and their fuel sources based on their position on the diagram. So star number one, which I've plotted, is more or less towards the right-hand side of the diagram. It's got relatively high B minus V value, which means that that star is red. Let's imagine for the moment, just as an example, that number one was not up here, but instead was down here on the main sequence. Then I would say that the evolutionary stage of star number one is a main sequence star. And we know that the fuel source for a main sequence star is hydrogen fusion in its core. And that's going to be different from red giant branch stars and also from horizontal branch stars. So all three of those different evolutionary stages will have different fueling mechanisms that cause them to appear in different places on the diagram. So that's how you'd answer the final question. I hope this walkthrough has been helpful. Good luck as you carry out your lab, and I'll talk to you in class.